Psst. You should probably watch my review of the first half of the series before continuing down the rabbit hole. This is the one I like to call the Day Filoni episode. It is also extremely forgettable and really urges parents to buy their kids Baby Yoda plushes. Just from the offset, Mando's being zapped in space, which inspired me to say that despite his ship being a piece of junk, I hope and pray that it slowly gets upgraded like his armor as the show progresses. This would have been the perfect episode to plant such seeds, but sadly he just goes to Tatooine. God damn. Tatooine for a repair. He meets Princess Carolyn in the flesh, in the flesh, who performs as well as one can with a script as weak as this. And I'm gonna raise you three bolts and a motivator. Ugh. It was nice that the child made an entrance to give her character more personality, but I'm not so sure about the Sims-esque music that played underneath it. I loved that she fell asleep with the child whilst Mando was gone though, that was pretty hilarious. Meanwhile, Mando wanders around looking for money. He finds the money shot with the Imperial helmets on spikes, but sadly this is only valuable to Disney and not him. This mahoosive plain as day reference to the original Star Wars is also valuable to Disney, but I'll give them credit seeing that droids, who were once forbidden in the cantina, are now running the place. It is no longer bustling with people or music playing, everything has changed. We're introduced to Toro, who will be the apprentice in the Master Apprentice dynamic Star Wars loves to throw at us when it can. Because of this, Mando once again ends up talking a lot more than I would have liked in this story. Unfortunately too, this actor seems to have Hayden Christensen's voice, so every time he pipes up, I get the urge to wear earplugs. The appearance of the Tusken Raiders felt a little forced too, but I was still entertained by the notion that they could be communicated with through sign language. It makes up for that dreadful pseudo jump scare we got in episode 1, and thankfully the negotiations were short. After being shot at by the assassin, it's revealed she's a woman. Thankfully they didn't completely rip off the final act of Full Metal Jacket, but sadly she is just another mercenary without any development aside from working for the huts at some point. At night time, Toro tries to pull a fast one on Mando. I found this part really amusing seeing as he's completely outclassed and embarrassed to get caught in the act of killing right here. After some co-op flares, they tie up the assassin, waiting until morning until her serpent's tongue makes him want to bite off more than he can chew. Unfortunately, his performance lets him down towards the end here. Bringing you in won't just make me a member of the guild. It'll make me legendary. You underestimate my power! And he then gets shot and everything turns back to normal. This is definitely the most fan serviceable episode with all its references. She's got the high ground. And the fact it's set on Tatooine, making it a bit of a meh affair all in all. Honestly, they could have just called this the heist episode and it really wouldn't have made much difference. Look at all these zany characters. They even got Rick Rubin on this episode. Thankfully, they weren't recurring characters and most of them were killed or imprisoned by the end. However, we would do well to remember the Disney Star Wars golden rule. No one's ever really gone. And admittedly, I'd be happy if Bill Burr was brought back for a future episode or two. It was nice that everything was rigged against Mando from the start. A droid flying his ship with a bunch of crackhead killers can't exactly be the most pleasant experience. Three things though. One, I'm glad the child wasn't forgotten about. Two, I liked Bill's suggestion that Mando might be a Gungan under the helmet. And three, seeing the droid fly Mando's hunk of junk with eloquence and exhilaration. Damn, that'd make a good roller coaster. You're welcome, Disney. I found the set of this prison ship to be rather cheap and dull, but I found Mando's time to shine really cool. Burr's backpack gun thing was really funny to watch and the way he held the group back from helping Mando fight these droids showed his lack of care should Mando die. Mando's armor and child are known to be more valuable than any bounty or job somebody might find in the galaxy. There was also a great standoff between the gang and this pilot
pilots they weren't expecting. All allegiances go out of the window when a life form gets in the way and the amount of gun pointing that goes on here was quite intense. Mando's reluctance to kill him was nice too, showing he's the only one of this bunch with a soft spot. All this build-up of mistrust and deceit makes the moments with Mando picking the gang off one by one really satisfying and enjoyable. Watching the big ugly guy throwing droids at each other was fun, as was seeing Mando escape from the cell he got thrown into. It did feel a little contrived though that the lock of the door was on the inside of the cell, but all the oil spilling out of the droid and having its head explode was a great moment. Mando's wrath was then shown as the gang and escapee are plunged into red. He splits the party up, but my god, this brother character wound me up the wrong way. Oh, Mr. Mayfield, you're gonna get me the hell off the ship. Uh, yeah, that's why he's here. It occurred to me how strangely quiet it was on this ship during this red lit sequence. One prisoner's been set free, and yet not a single other one makes a sound throughout the remainder of the episode. This just makes the dullness of the set design feel more empty as a result. I felt the fight between the big pink guy and Mando was pretty cool though. Whistling birds did no good, sliding doors didn't stop him, and he's fiery resistant too, foreshadowed earlier by the shot of him after killing those two droids. The way he stealthily took out the other two was impressive considering his hefty armour. It was most effective seeing the lights flashing with Mando getting closer and closer so ominously and yet totally badass at the same time. It was a nice twist with the tracking beacon being placed on the ship with a Dave Filoni cameo. Then to see those we thought he'd killed stuck together in a cell was a much more satisfying conclusion conclusion than I would have expected. I wouldn't be too unhappy if they made a return, but I also liked that Mando's one line to the child in this episode basically implied he had all this figured out from the start. It even seems to be suggesting that this was all the child's idea, even though it can't have possibly been the case. Another rather unimportant episode, but definitely enjoyable moments are strewn throughout. All right, the two-part finale, here we go. They really ramped up the stakes with this offer you can't refuse communication Mando receives. One last job for his and the child's freedom. Well, actually, there's a couple of stops he needs to make before that. The first is to pick up Cara Dune, his only friend in the galaxy. It was quite amusing that all he needed to say was the word Imperial to persuade her to go with him. Even cooler is how the ex-Imperials are referred to as imps to soften their perceived brutality and cold-hearted nature. On his ship, Cara gets access to the many Chekhov guns that have been teased since episode one, and the child piloting the ship was adorably fun too. When they arrived back on Mars, there was this fantastic montage of Queel reprogramming IG-11 for etiquette, not destruction. The way he's animated to appear stiff and clunky was a really great touch, accompanied by the sound of a music box to give it a newfound childlike quality. Queel's character is fantastic too, just a straight up good guy who doesn't need money but the satisfaction of protecting a child from the spirit of the Empire. We know the stories of rising and falling empires throughout human history history, but never of those that rebuild and maintain the societies that follow them. Now that Mando has a crew with him, they head back to Navarro. This sequence on board Mando's ship was excellent. Not only is everybody busy occupying themselves instead of having bland, fillery conversations, but to see the potential dark side in the child was quite unexpected. This leads to a superb escalation of tension. Hot-headed Kara arguing with wise old Queel, and the droid ominously hanging over all of it. Just fantastic setups for the events to come. All the characters then meet up on the lava plains where they foreshadowed the magma as soon as they started plodding their way through it. Once again, there's an effective nighttime action sequence with these flying creatures attacking them all. It was incredible watching a blurg getting picked up like a sheep, and the fact you can barely make out what these creatures look like makes them all the more frightening. Even seeing the child healing Kaga made for a nice contrast compared to what it did to Kara on Mando's ship. The child is truly 
truly a force of nature, attempting to decide who lives and who dies. The group arrive at the treacherous hive of scum and villainy, and Herzog's final scene is just fantastic. The way he justified the siege of Mandalore was just spine-chilling. This might be the first time anybody has justified the Imperial position and sounded persuasive. I was reminded of the scene in Episode 5 when Mando goes to the Mos Eisley Cantina and it's practically empty and run by droids. Compare that to when the Empire was running things, business was booming. This is exactly the kind of world building I like to see in a TV show, and Herzog's delivery of his monologue was just perfect. We might actually get some insight into how the First Order came about in future episodes, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. For now, things are brewing just nicely. Mando is then saved by the bell, and from here things escalate so quickly as the Black Stormtroopers kill the White Stormtroopers it's insane! This shot of them all lined up was the perfect precursor to the incredible mobilisation of troopers that happens afterwards. This sinister music that plays provides the perfect entrance for Moff Gideon, played by 2020's favourite bad guy actor Giancarlo Esposito. I thought it was awesome to see his TIE fighter flatten itself for landing. I did always wonder how they got into those things. I remember in the old Star Wars Battlefront games, you just pushed a button and then you were in. Sadly, a similar thing happens in this show when Gideon appears from within the top of the ship. We then cut to a shot of Mando and then Karga, and suddenly Gideon's on the ground without even hearing the planting of his feet. Did he have to slide off it or something? Does he have stairs that come out? Fortunately, the ending of this episode is very saddening. The one good guy in the galaxy is just annihilated by the stormtroopers and the guitar that plays is super sad too. The baby getting scooped up at astonishing speed and this mystery antagonist appearing seemingly out of nowhere. What a cliffhanger! Everything is in freefall, and I had to wait a whole week to find out how it got resolved. Just the way I like it. Oh boy! I had constant goosebumps on my first watch of this episode, and it's owed to the build-up from previous episodes. This is accompanied by some incredibly tight comedy and drama that flows throughout this finale. It starts with this hilarious speeder bike sequence that mocks the inaccurate stormtrooper trope to the nth degree. It certainly wasn't pleasant watching this guy punch the child, but this is a truly tyker scene. The director doesn't waste time making his mark by having this dark humour surround two troopers that are nonchalant towards their fellow troopers being exterminated. Like the Jawa action sequence in episode 2, I didn't know I wanted to see what stormtroopers got up to during their downtime. Thankfully, IG-11, now a nurse droid, destroys expectations in a heartbeat by smacking these guys to a pulp. It felt so good to watch this, to then hear the theme blasting away from both Xylophone and brass instruments really pumped me up to see IG-11 rescue Mando and company. The troopers bring a gigantic gaming PC to shame the console peasants inside. They can't quite blast their way into the sewer vent like Princess Leia once did, making a mockery of how easy Star Wars protagonists usually have it. It was interesting to hear that Kara was from Alderaan, clarifying why she accepted Mando's offer the moment he mentioned Imperials. The fact Gideon knows all three of their names displays intelligence on behalf of our antagonist, trying to whittle down any hopes of escape. Whilst he's monologuing, there was the subtlest of dolly zooms used here, enhancing the threat this character poses. We are then treated to another wonderful flashback where the term foundlings finally gets its meaning. There's real trauma buried beneath this character, despite his family not even being named or characterised in any way. The delay-heavy electric guitar gives this moment of rescue a sense of epicness as this mystery Mandalorian flies away with baby Mando in his arms. It's nice to think that there's a place for orphans and lost children to go, giving them purpose and bringing goodness to the galaxy. That killing efficiency we witnessed in Episode 1 is turned up to god mode as IG-11 obliterates these stormtroopers with ease. I definitely shared the child's look of enthusiasm here. This fight mirrors that of Episode 1's ending with Mando using
using a turret gun, but this time pulling it off like the Master Chief from Halo would. The explosions in this sequence have such a significant knockback, making the combat feel very impactful and suspense-ridden. Unfortunately, Mando still needs more upgrades in the second season as he gets shot in the neck by Gideon. With the gang back inside hiding again, we see Gideon command the burning of this place. The way he bats his eyelids as though he's attempting to hold back his murderous intent was marvellous. I think Esposito does a cracking job in his role, and this is just one example of why his performances as bad guys are so good. This is followed up with a flame trooper, ready and waiting. Even with a helmet on, his body language indicates this guy enjoys his job. I love the red patterns as well, reminiscent of the shock troopers seen towards the end of Clone Wars and in Revenge of the Sith. The child comes in at the perfect time to prove its utility for good, and Mando gets patched up by IG-11. I honestly wasn't expecting to see Pedro Pascal's face eight episodes in, but it's a perfect moment all the same. I'm not a living thing was the perfect excuse to take the helmet off. It definitely reminded me of Darth Vader's removal of his helmet at the end of Return, and to see Mando's beliefs in droids completely altered in this scene was perfect too. Down in the sewers, Mando's torch produces quite astounding lens flares, perhaps a nod to J.J. Abrams. It was quite the gut punch to see all the Mandalorian helmets in a pile too. Mando broke the Creed's rules slightly in the previous scene. Now, those that would care if he did take the helmet off are potentially dead. In this scene with the armorer, Mando finally receives his purpose, return the child to its home planet. This certainly feels like a mission that will take multiple seasons, but this is exactly what excites me about the prospect of this show going on for years. The biggest question mark in the Star Wars franchise surrounds Yoda and his species. Instead of the Mandalorian just needing to get some pocket money, he has a grander purpose now, and this excites me to no end. And he gets his goddamn jetpack too! Yeah, baby! Ba-boom! <laughs> Although I'm not sure how I feel about the armorer fighting stormtroopers with her hammer. Gotta be honest with you guys. The characters departing and the music that plays was more than enough for me. It's mainly because literally the first scene of this episode was mocking the inaccuracy of stormtroopers, and sadly in this scene, it's painful to watch all the opportunities to shoot her get blatantly ignored. The droid punter was an amazing moment though, once again breaking Mando's beliefs about them as it appeared initially hostile but just served a solitary function. IG-11's function to not get captured provides the most incredible and emotional climax of the story. Possibly the longest Chekhov's gun ever gets pulled out here and brings our characters out to safety. I'm not too saddened though, as droids are easily manufactured and I'm sure an upgraded IG-12 or something will grace our screens in the next series. And even if he doesn't, this character's arc is completed here in thoroughly satisfying fashion. Giancarlo Esposito may be acting his ass off, but seeing him in the TIE Fighter did make me laugh, as did the baby magic hand thing. Fortunately, Unfortunately, Mando chasing after him with his jetpack magic string combo made it all worthwhile. Holy cow, I was on the edge of my seat. Right up until the ship blew up, crash landed, and Moff Gideon, unbelievably, was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> the Filoni Favreau influence is strong in this one. It's amazing because if the legends are true, there's only one of these Darksabers in existence. We know that Gideon was involved in the Siege of Mandalore, so presumably this is where he got it from. I have so many questions though. Is he proficient with it? Does he have force abilities too? What is going on here? The ending with Mando jetpacking away was a beautiful ending to the series, mirroring his own rescue at the hands of another Mandalorian. Unfortunately, Karga's dialogue feels a bit pointless, seeing as Mando's path is now laid out before him, but as Mando flies away in the ship after that beautiful burial of Queel, he was so flipping close to where Gideon had crashed that he neglected to even notice it when flying off. It sure beats having an after credit scene though, and I was left thoroughly anticipating the next season when it comes in October? Oh, that soon, huh? This is excellent news. So, 
did it suck? For the majority of the show, no way, Jose. Mando as a character is definitely the highlight of this series for me, which is quite an achievement considering he wears a helmet for the vast majority of his screen time. The child is also a quality of the show that was handled stupendously. The writing is immaculate and the action sublime. The characters are great for the most part too, as is the music. Instead of the typically bright, shiny, colourful, operatic Star Wars we all know and love, this incarnation of the franchise has been stripped back Back to the core of what it was originally intended to be. I am optimistic for this show in the future now that Mando has a purpose that I eagerly await to see fulfilled. Finally, here are the scores. I give Mandalorian Season 1 an 8 out of 10. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more content like this, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon and subscribe to the channel. What do you think of The Mandalorian? Comment below your thoughts or join us for a Benny on the Discord server where we'll continue this discussion.